something new today. Namely, this microphone. So, we'll see how it goes. Um, also, you might have noticed, <sighs> this is the first of this series in which I have worn the same shirt for the second time. And unless I go on a shirt shopping spree, from here on out, you're going to be seeing shirts you've already seen before. This is episode 24. So now you know I own 23 shirts that I'm willing to wear on camera. After I lose some kgs, as they say, outside of the U.S., there's probably about 10 more shirts, but they just look a little tight on me right now. <clears throat> I'm a little vain. What can I say? So if you want um, to start with uh, Black Books 1 you know, through 23, then that's the playlist for you. Otherwise, here's episode 24. Now, I remember someone bit something or psychologically accepted. I just stopped it in the middle of an individual relationship of a soul, the age of Philemon, um, working for him. Developed shit, I don't know. I'm just gonna start reading, and maybe at some point I'll be like, oh, this is where I stopped last time. Sorry, I didn't prepare much. He continued to note a few further dialogues with his soul, but his confrontation with the anima had affected had effectively reached a closure at this point. In contrast to a marriage, Tony Wolf saw her relationship with Jung as an individual relation. I do remember this. On December 20th, 1924, she noted, quote, marriage is socially, legally, psychologically accepted. Nothing new can come from there. It can only be transformed. Also individually through individual relationships. That is why the individual relationship is a symbol of the soul, end quote. On September 13, 1923, she noted that their relationship stood, quote, under the age of Philemon. I think I, I am on the next page. When I am on my own, it eats away at me. That's the last thing I said, right? Uh, C is not only a vitamin, also when I'm with him, the rising sun is good. Yeah, relaxing. Everything destructive has gone. When I am on my own, it eats away at me. End quote. Now, picking up where we left off last time. She repeatedly tried, but failed, to be more important of him. What? I mean, use modern English if you're writing in modern English. This isn't even... Um, she felt that his fame and success were increasingly taking him away from her and resented, quote, his works, ideas, patience, lectures, E, bracket parentheses, Emma, and bracket parentheses, his wife, comma, children, End quote. This was cause for bitterness. Quote, again, some resistance when I think how he realized all his famous ideas through the relationship with me. This is a quote. Tony Wolf saying this. Um, parentheses, which he only admits occasionally. End parentheses. Oh, by the way, we're listening to um, this. It's my yoga hour. It's, you can use it. You can listen to it. It just started at the beginning. It starts with like uh, laying down. I mean, not every sequence. There's some like yoga people that'd be like, what? Pfft. You start standing. Always. No exceptions. I'm like, okay. Um, anyway, so it starts laying down and then uh, slowly come, you know, do some uh, supine postures, warm-up stuff, then get into a seated position, do some stretches, twists, warm-ups, and then um, eventually you get into like a um, sun salutation type thing. Right now, it's still, you're still on your back. You're still on your back at this point. All right. So yeah, you can use that, that playlist. That's what we're listening to today while I recite this.
if it gets too loud. In fact, it's probably not too loud, but just so it doesn't get distracting. All right. Now I get to find where I was. Quote, uh, yeah, no, here we are. So we're in the middle of, of Tony Wolf. Okay. And how famous he is now. And that E, Emma, Jung, um, is with him instead of me, and how I can never accompany him there. And quote, an entry of 1937 simply states, quote, a Rodney on Doxos, end quote, implicitly likening her situation to that of Arad Ariadne, excuse me, Ariadne. Um, abandoned on the island of Noxos after leading Theseus through the labyrinth. In dedicated copies of his books, Jung gave private acknowledgement of her involvement. Her copy of Psychological Types bears the dedication. This book, as you know, has come to me from that world which you have brought to me. Only you know out of which misery it was born, and in which spirit it was written. I put it in your hands as a sign of gratitude, which I cannot express through words." End quote. Likewise, her copy of Psychology and Alchemy, 1944, bears a dedication to his, quote, Soror Mystica, end quote. In public, he acknowledged her active role in all the phases of analytical psychology in his introduction to her collected papers. End of the section. Next section. The culmination is the title of the section. On January 2, 1927, Jung had a dream set in Liverpool. I am with several young Swiss in Liverpool. Down by the docks, it is a dark, rainy night with smoke and clouds. We walk up to the upper part of town, which lies on a plateau. We come to a small circular lake in a centrally located garden. In the middle of this, there is an island. The men speak of a Swiss who lives here in such a sooty, dark, dirty city. But I see that on the island stands a magnolia tree covered with red flowers illuminated by an eternal sun. And think, quote, now I know why the Swiss fellow lives here. He apparently knows why. I see the city map." End quote. <clears throat> he then painted a mandala based upon this map. He attached great significance to this dream, later commenting, This dream is my inner situation. I still now see this gray raincoat shining with the moisture of the and everything was terribly unpleasant. That is how I felt about myself, but I had the inner vision of this heavenly beauty, and thanks to that, one can live. And then I saw that is conclusive. That is the goal. One cannot go above the middle. The middle is the goal, and everything was directed toward this. From this I recognized that the self is an archetype of orientation and of meaning. The one Swiss is the I. Letter I, not E-Y-E. -E. He lives in one of the filthy, sooty streets. The filthy streets in one of the carefors. Carefors? Carefors, I don't know. Looks French. He is a small replica of the center. 
I know that the I is not the center. It is not the self. But from there, I have a sight of the divine wonder. I certainly did not live there, but I lived, quote, eccentric, eccentrically, yeah, eccentrically, end quote, period, in the end, you know, because it comes before the end quote. That's just how grammar punctuation. Um, the small light, now this is like where you're starting to, like, hopefully at least be doing like the, after the cat and calf, you reach one arm forward and left arm back and then gradually start building toward doing a little bit of uh, like the vinyasa. It's the part of Ashtanga vinyasa that uh, is most memorable where you put your arms up and then do uh, touch your toes and jump back and do upward dog and then do downward dog and then maybe you jump back to where you started and all that. Start building up to that. Not quite doing that yet, but let me turn it up. This is a good track, and it's long too. It's nice. Yeah, we're gonna rock out to some Kodo uh, music. Let me get my uh, stuff here. I was taking a lot of pictures. Oops, I bumped my, my, I bumped your eye there. Sorry, everybody. Um, I was taking a lot of pictures of the backs of Indian trucks, just because I find them fun and colorful and interesting. And they all say, blow, okay, horn. So she got me this. Isn't that cute? Blow a horn, it says, inside of it. So, yeah. Japanese Kodo music. Quite a thing. Wouldn't you say? I'd say yes. All right. Now I've got my magnifying glass help me with all this tiny font for I don't know why Carl Jung's voice has become some kind of I don't even know what I want to say noir sleeves voice maybe it's the hat all right Bring on the noir sleeves. Um, yes. He is a replica of the center. I know that the eye is not the center. We've read this already. Um, the small light appeared to me as the likeness of the great light. So there was also something in the eccentric aspect which recalled the original vision for me. After this dream, I gave up painting or drawing mandalas. I then understood that there was no straight line of development, but that development first led up from below onto the mountain. That is one straight line development. But if one is initially above, one sees the great expanse with the lake, the island, and the tree of light within it. Four dots. This dream described the apex of the whole unconscious process of development. It completely satisfied me since it fully expressed uh, my situation. I was utterly lonely then. I knew that I was occupied with something quite great. Oh, his noir voice went away, sorry. But which no one understood. This clarification through the dream made it possible for me to consider objectively what filled me. <laughs> it's back. For me, the small sidelight was the eye. It was like a recollection of the magnificent tree in the middle. 
The others did not see the tree. Only I saw it. It was as if the sun sh shone there, but it was also as if the flowers were self-illuminated. It was as if this tree stood in sunlight. It was bright day there and unbelievably beautiful. Where we stood was dark, cold, and showery night. My life would have actually lost its meaning without such a vision. But the meaning was expressed here. Cool. The realization... Now we're back to Sonu. That's the end of the tiny font, different margin of, of Jung recollecting his experience. Back to Sonu. The realization was that the self was the goal of the process of individuation. Progression was not linear, but involved a circumambulation of the self. This realization gave him strength, for, quote, otherwise the whole existence would have driven me crazy, or would have driven other people crazy, end quote. He felt that the mandala drawings showed him the self, quote, in its saving function, and that this was his salvation. The task now was one of consolidating these insights into his life and science. In his 1926 revision of the psychology of the unconscious processes, he highlighted the significance of the midlife transition. He argued that the first half of life could be characterized as the natural phase, in which the prime aim was establishing oneself in the world, earning an income, raising a family. The second half, the cultural phase, involved a reevaluation of earlier values. The goal in this period was one of conserving precious values, previous values, while recognizing their opposites. This meant that individuals had to develop the undeveloped and neglected aspects of their personality. The individuation process was now conceived as the general pattern of human development. He argued that there was a lack of guidance for this transition in contemporary society. And he saw his psychology as filling this lacuna, lacuna matata, L-A-C-U-N-A. -A. All right, moving right along. Outside of analytical psychology, Jung's formulations had an impact on the field of adult development psychology. Clearly, his crisis experience formed the template for this conception of the tasks of the two halves of life. The Black Books and Liber Novus depict his reappraisal of his previous values and his attempt to develop the neglected aspects of personality. Thus, they formed the basis of his understanding of how the midlife transition could be successfully navigated. In 1928, as we have seen, he published The Relations Between the I and the Unconscious. It was a small book, expanding on his 1916 paper, quote, The Structure of the Unconscious, period, end quote. That's full stop, the punctuation mark period for those. Jung wrote about the, quote, interior drama, end quote, of the transformation process. He enlarged upon his earlier discussion and added a section dealing in detail with the process of individuation. He noted that after one had dealt with the fantasies from the personal sphere, one met with fantasies from the impersonal sphere. Ooh, villain name, the impersonal sphere. That's terrifying. Um, these were not simply arbitrary, but 
covert converged upon a goal. Hence, these latter fantasies could be described as processes of initiation. For this process to take place, the song would have to change from Kodo music to, let's say, um, uh, John Coltrane's daughter after her trip to India. Yeah, that's about right. Alice Coltrane. Um, yes, uh, active participation was required. Quote, when the conscious mind participates actively and experiences each stage of the process, then the next image always starts off on the higher level that has been won, and purposefulness develops, end quote. After the assimilation of the personal unconscious, the differentiation <clears throat> of the persona and the overcoming of the state of godlikeness. By the way, at this point, you're doing like the full quote unquote vinyasa thing with the jumping and the upward dog and the downward dog and then um, opening up the hips in a sort of dancey way and uh, going into a uh, warrior two extended side angle and uh, reverse warrior dance that leads into a trikonasana that goes to an Ardha Chandrasana on each side during this song, if you're in my class. All right. Uh, we're for this little, 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 little. Is it too loud? Maybe I should turn it down a little. I don't, sometimes I worry that the bass doesn't. Without the bass, so many songs are all treble and no bass. Never mind. Um, yes, so his, in a bit of, what was I saying? What was I reading? After the assimilation of the personal unconscious, the differentiation of the persona, and the overcoming of the state of godlikeness, I don't think we've read this yet. Um, yeah. Okay, let's try that again. Slower. After the assimilation of the personal unconscious, the differentiation of the persona, and the overcoming of the state of godlikeness, the next stage was the integration of the anima for men and the animus for women. Jung argued that just as it was essential for a man to distinguish between what he was and how he appeared to others, it was essential to become conscious of his quote, of quote, his invisible relations to the unconscious, end quote and hence to differentiate himself from the anima. He noted that when the anima was unconscious, it was projected. Oh, right, yeah. He laid out the following sequence in the development of the anima and its relation to the man's mother. The first bearer of the soul image is always the mother. Later, it is born by those women who arouse the man's feelings. Whether in a positive or negative sense, because the mother is the first bearer of the soul image, separation from her is a delicate and important matter of the greatest educational significance. <laughs> yeah, so for a man, the mother, quote, protects him against the dangers that threaten from the darkness of his soul, end quote. Subsequently, the anima in the form of the mother image, imago, yep, that's imago, in the form of the mother imago is transferred to the wife. Quote, his wife has to take over the magical role of the mother under the cloak of the ideally exclusive marriage. 
He is really seeking his mother's protection, and thus he plays into the hands of his wife's protective instincts. End quote. What is ultimately required is, quote, the objectification of the anima. Doesn't sound good. End quote. A successful engagement and integration led to Tiny Font, the overcoming of the anima as an autonomous complex and her transformation into a function of relationship between consciousness and the unconscious. Through this process, the anima forfeits the demonic power of an autonomous complex. That means she can no longer exercise possession since she is depotentated. Depotentiated? Right. And tiny font. To achieve this depossession, one needed to enter into dialogue with her and pose questions. Through inner dialogue or active imagination, everyone, he claimed, had this ability to hold dialogues with him hyphen or herself. Active imagination would thus be one form of inner dialogue, a type of that dramatized thinking. It was critical to disidentify from the thoughts that arose and to overcome the assumptions that one had produced them oneself. What was most essential was not interpreting or understanding the fantasies of, uh, but experiencing them. This represented a shift from his paper on the transcendent function in which he had emphasized creative formulation and understanding. He argued that one should treat the fantasies completely literal while one was engaged in them, but symbolically when one interpreted them. All right, is that like an end quote or what is that, a footnote? Footnote 334. And the first time I've noticed that there's a numbered footnote, that means 333 just went whew. All right. This was a direct description of the procedure in the black books. The task of such discussions was to objectify the effects of the anima and become conscious of the underlying content while integrating these into consciousness. When one had succeeded in doing this, the anima then became a function of the relationship between consciousness and the unconscious, enabling communication between the two, as opposed to working as an autonomous complex. Again, this process of the integration of the anima was the subject of Liber Novus and the Black Books. It also highlights the fact uh, that the fantasies here should be read symbolically and not literally. To take statements from them out of context and to cite them literally would represent a serious misunderstanding. You noted that this process had three effects. Tiny font, go. The first effect is that the range of consciousness is increased by the inclusion of a great number and variety of unconscious contents. The second is a gradual diminution of the dominating influence of the unconscious. The third is an alteration in the personality. And that is uh, what I'm going to read today. So what do you think?
Okay. <laughs>